China is one of the very few countries that can provide goods and services from all the four industrial revolutions. That's why the United States lost the trade war and is losing the tech war. I will just uh, share with you a few points here. Uh, one is that uh, as a scholar who focuses on the Chinese model of development, I always say China has indeed succeeded in building socialism. For one thing, China is the largest economy since 2014 by purchasing power parity. So it's already nine years into this status. And China produced the world's largest middle class, 400 million people, real middle class. When they go to America, they are also middle class, so larger than the US population. China is at the forefront of the new industrial revolution. I just got this uh, Huawei Mate 60 yesterday. <laughs> I know it's better than Apple, the yeah, iPhone, yeah. And uh, which means uh, already uh, China is different. Uh, what's more important is, uh, as we all know, this uh, world order is grossly unfair and unjust what people call, and many scholars describe as dependency, as a peripheral central relationship. And China is perhaps the first large economy, developing country, that has broken through this dependency. In other words, China itself has become a center. I put this way, it's simultaneously the largest trading partner, investment partner, and the technology partner with the periphery, with developing countries, and with the West, if they prefer, we are capability there. Yeah. Of course, they are having their own problems to sort out. So this capacity means a lot. The world is no longer the same. For instance, if you look at the US monetary policy so far, in the past, with this kind of uh, printing US dollars, many countries will run into financial crisis and go bankrupt. But this time, technically, only a small country called the Sri Lanka was completely broken. But other developing countries also experienced tremendous difficulties, but not yet completely broken. Countries like Argentina, like Brazil, in tremendous difficulty, but now they trade with China. Yeah, they borrow Chinese currency or Chinese dollars, whatever. So this means a lot of uh, changes uh, in this uh, uh, new world with the rise of China. And concerning the uh, Chinese model, we have to mention, as some of you already mentioned, the Chairman Mao and Chairman Deng Xiaoping. Mao's role in political liberation of the Chinese people, in engaging so many social revolutions, land reform, women's liberation, basic education, basic uh, medical system for all Chinese. So this kind of social structure has been laid by Chairman Mao. Yet it's also true that by the time when Deng Xiaoping came to power, China was a very poor country by per capita GDP. It's lower, or far lower than most African countries. Yet with uh, four decades of uh, reform and opening up, Indeed, China succeeded in what we call learning from outside world, engage with globalization, but in a critical way. That's very important. As Deng Xiaoping said, we have to be selective. Otherwise, we embrace economic liber liberalization, but not political liberalization. Even within economic liberalization, we also were also selective. As a result, China is one of the few that has indeed uh, uh, outperformed others in globalization. Now with BRI, China is actually trying to shape a new type of globalization. The older type is based on neoliberalism. It's based on more or less zero-sum game. The West win, others lose. Now, BRI is uh, basically based on this philosophy of uh, uh, discussing together, building together, benefiting together. This new type of globalization is gaining momentum. Now over 150 countries have joined this 
what we call the modesty initiative. It's really changing the surface of the world. And behind this, there are very important Chinese ideas. If the Western idea is divide and rule, the Chinese idea is unite and prosper. And this is practiced within China, but also now outside China. We hope Africa will be united, Middle East will be united, Europe will be united, Southeast Asia will be united, Asia will be united, Latin America will be united. The more united, the better. This is really based on our Chinese civilization. You can only be united. For one thing, why Pan-Africanism is so important? Given the scale of modernization, you need to have a market, the size of a market. Any investor goes to a country. If to go to Benin, the market is very small. They prefer to have a larger market, say, West Africa or Southern Africa, or even larger, Pan-Africa. In other words, the more united market is, the better for investment. It produces better results for investment. In this sense, you know, I think it's uh, crucial. Another important idea from Chinese model is uh, what we call people's livelihood first. This is also very much part of the philosophy of Chinese Communist Party. Whatever you do, political, economic, social, policies, you should end up in tangible benefits for people. In other words, politics is not just slogans, it's just empty coffee, chat, whatever. It should be produce tangible results. The Chinese approach is quite down to earth and pragmatic, produce good results. Now, having said that, uh, this particular Ukrainian crisis, conflict, and the Russian approach to the uh, sanctions imposed by the United States. I describe it this way. I said the United States has launched a currency war against Russia. The Chinese expression of currency war or currency is made of two words. One is goods or natural resources or goods. The other is money. So these two words together constitute currency. Now, amazingly, if you look at this, Russia said, yes, we have goods, resources, you have money, but your money cannot buy our goods and resources. You have to use our money. I see this message is revolutionary. Today, if you look at the BRICS summit held in Johannesburg, there's five original members plus new members and plus 20 more who want to be members. All the goods are in this camp. So this is very important. If you look at the structure of the BRICS, the 11 members, there are internal differences between China, between India, between other countries. Yet, there is one commonality. All of them want to change the current international order. Unipolar order, dominated by United States and West, into a multipolar order in which the West and the rest are at least in parity with each other. So this is revolutionary. So when I think of today, you have uh, BRICS, you have uh, G77 plus China, and uh, we have Global South, and we have uh, goods. That's important. China has manufactured goods. I call China rise of uh, four industrial revolutions in one, first, second, third, and fourth, and China in the frontier. China is one of the very few countries that can provide goods and services from all the four industrial revolutions. That's why the United States lost the trade war and is losing the tech war. If you look at the trade surplus last year, largest, number one, China. Number two, Russia, despite the sanctions imposed by the West. Number three, Saudi Arabia. So all these are in the global south. So. Uh, in China today, we are talking about the uh, what's called the internal circulation. Given the further pressure and sanction from the United States, the West against China, China has to consider within China itself, we can do everything. Of course, this last resort philosophy strategy, actually we prefer both circulation, internal and external, we are promoting that. Within the global South today, 
within the BRICS and the expanded BRICS, we can already have this internal circulation. This is why the West is so much afraid of, fearful of the rise of global south and expansion of the BRICS. So I think we have uh, far better conditions than before to really change the current international order. As we have discussed in different ways, defeat hegemonism, imperialism, and this old, outdated global order, and replace it with a new order, which is more people-friendly, people-centered, and more socialistic. Mm -hmm.